I'm excited now to turn it over to Dr. Angela Rasmussen, who is a virologist at the Vaccine and Infectious Disease Organization, or VITO, at the University of Saskatchewan. Dr. Rasmussen will be talking about the changing landscape of vaccine requirements, boosters, and vaccines, and variants, excuse me. All right, well, thank you so much, Saskia. And let me just share my screen here. Okay. All right, so, um, oops. So as Saskia just mentioned today, I will be talking about uh, the, the changing landscape of vaccine requirements, boosters and variants. Um, really, I'm just gonna be mostly talking today about variants given last week's news about the Delta variant and transmission in potentially vaccinated people um, and what that means in terms of needing boosters. And I'll, we'll discuss a little bit the implications this could be for travel but this is really going to be um, a, a fairly science focused presentation rather than a policy focused one. Oops. All right, so I, I like to usually begin these by um, doing a territorial acknowledgement equity statement. And today I am in Saskatoon presenting from the Treaty 6 territory in the ancestral lands of the Métis people. Um, most of my research uh, throughout the past couple of years has been performed here, as well as on the unceded ancestral homelands of the Duwamish, Puyallup, and Lenape peoples. And I acknowledge and honor the first peoples of North America, their tribal governments and histories and ancestry, and their roles to this day in caring for these lands and waters. And I also would like to acknowledge the long history of systemic inequity in academic science. Two institutions where I've studied and worked, Columbia University and Georgetown University, were founded using profits from the transatlantic slave trade and excluded women and people of color from their academic communities for nearly two centuries. This has left a long and painful legacy of racial and gender-based inequality that continues to this day. And I encourage all of you watching to consider how you can contribute to making public health a more equitable enterprise for everybody. So let's just get right into this. When, when thinking about SARS coronavirus 2 transmission, regardless of variants, um, during travel, we need to think about how this virus is actually transmitted. Um, because variants, uh, you know, have had a lot of really scary news about them. Um, they, they are more transmissible in some cases like Delta, but that doesn't actually mean that they're being transmitted by different routes. They're just more transmissible by the existing routes of transmission. And these are the routes that we need to think about how to mitigate. Um, so the most common routes of transmission for SARS coronavirus 2 are inhalation, of infectious aerosols. These are uh, small particles of respiratory secretions containing infectious virus that you breathe, uh, thus allowing the virus to get access to your respiratory tract and the cells producing uh, ACE2, the, the viral receptor that it uses to enter and infect cells. Also, uh, this can be transmitted by direct contact or droplet transmission. This is exposure to respiratory secretions either through directly contacting somebody and, and directly contacting those secretions, such as kissing somebody, um, or by uh, getting those droplets onto your body and then that by that route, uh, introducing them to your respiratory tract. And less common modes of transmission or unknown, uh, unknown frequency transmission occurs via the ocular, oral, um, or indirect contact uh, route, which is also sometimes referred to as fomite transmission. These are possible. Um, they, in some cases, they've been demonstrated experimentally, uh, but they it's unknown how often these occur in the real world. So this is what we need to be thinking about in terms of mitigating uh, exposure risk while traveling. We also need to think about the course of disease uh, of COVID-19 itself, when caused by infection by SARS coronavirus 2. After a person becomes infected, and Kathy really discussed this very nicely, uh, there will be a period of time in which that person is not detectable uh, by any type of test that's used, but nonetheless does have replicating virus in their respiratory tract, um, and they have not yet developed symptoms. And we know one of the things that is really most insidious about this particular virus and its transmission is that a significant amount of transmission does occur during this pre-symptomatic phase when people uh, may not even realize that they've been exposed, much less that they're infected and shedding infectious virus. Viral loads will go up. Um, they, are, they usually peak right around the time of symptom onset, uh, and then they will start to decline. Now, as Kathy also mentioned, during this period of decline, um, whether you go on to develop severe illness or not, you can still detect viral RNA by testing, uh, and, and that is not associated with infectious virus or onward transmission. So this is really a challenge 
in terms of how to incorporate testing to really distinguish between people uh, who may be an infectious risk to others versus those um, who have detectable virus test positive, but are not actually a transmission risk. Um, and as I mentioned before, this has been one of the biggest challenges that we know that, that viral replication really does peak um, in many cases before symptom onset. Uh, and there, there is some evidence in a preprint that, that came out uh, a couple weeks ago that in the case of Delta, um, this pre-symptomatic period may occur very rapidly after exposure um, in which people are testing positive for very high uh, viral RNA loads um, without having any symptoms at all before they, they go on to become symptomatic. So uh, this, this continues to be a real challenge with more transmissible variants like Delta. This is even more of a challenge. Um, and it's also important to note that many of the mitigations that have been applied or that are being discussed um, for being applied uh, do not completely eliminate risk. They can reduce it. And some of these mitigation measures are more effective than others. Um, so symptom self-reporting can be really, really challenging because as you can see here, and this is from last spring, um, there have been a number of different symptoms associated with COVID-19. So it can be very difficult to get people to, uh, to recognize that they are even experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 in some cases because they may not recognize that that symptom, which can be very vague, which can also apply to other infectious diseases, may actually be a symptom of COVID. So things like sore throat, runny nose, even cough, um, how do you distinguish that from allergies or from a common cold infection? It can be very, very difficult. And of course, there's, the also, there's also the fact that people might intentionally uh, not report their symptoms if they feel that it could prevent them from traveling, especially if that travel is essential. Um, similarly, people may not be or may be reluctant to report symptoms if they think that it's going to make the difference between them uh, coming into a country um, versus being in quarantine for an extended period of time. And that can have extended uh, cost ramifications as well. Um, particularly in places that have impl implemented a mandatory hotel quarantine that's usually at the expense of the traveler. Um, temperature screening, similarly, this study showed that more or less it doesn't work. One of the reasons for COVID and it's particularly ineffective is again, a lot of transmission can be pre-symptomatic. So people may not be showing any symptoms at all. Um, in addition, not everybody gets a fever who gets COVID. And in addition to that, um, if people take over-the-counter fever reducers, analgesics such as acetaminophen, paracetamol, or ibuprofen, um, they can reduce those fevers. Temperature screening has never really been a reliable method of screening for any infectious disease. It's one that, that can work, but it usually has to be implemented with other mitigations and other testing strategies. Um, so... It, uh, it really is not very good at predicting which travelers have SARS coronavirus 2 infection and which don't. And then of course there's travel testing, which Kathy um, really discussed in detail and very nicely. Um, travel testing can be very effective, but it really depends on how that testing strategy is being implemented. It also can depend on prevalence, um, both in the place that the traveler is originating from, as well as the place that they're going and the duration of the testing interval from the time that the person gets the test to the time that they actually get on a plane and go. And one thing we really do need to think about, and this is why it's critical to think about these routes of transmission for SARS coronavirus 2, is that the process of traveling itself um, is high risk for transmission in many situations. Now, while, while planes themselves, there has been transmission on long haul flights, but that, that risk can be very effectively mitigated because planes do have uh, robust air filtration. They're generally well ventilated once they're in the air. And, uh, and if people are you know, spaced out, if there's uh, control of capacity for passengers, um, the plane environment itself can be fairly low risk, especially if people are wearing masks. But um, the process of getting to the airport and people, people take ride share, they may ride on public transportation, uh, in poorly ventilated, crowded environments. When they arrive at customs, oftentimes that's very crowded. Uh, there's no ability to socially distance. There's, no, um, there's not necessarily masks. There's not necessarily good ventilation in many arrival halls. Uh, there may not be air filtration. So, and there's extended close contact with others. So um, many parts of the travel experience can be, uh, can be high risk for transmission.
And if you are being tested three days before, even with PCR, which is more sensitive than a rapid antigen test, you could still become infected uh, in that interval of the, the three days and the time that you travel. Um, and that would potentially go undetected depending on what the, the arrival requirements are for testing. So it's important to, to realize that when we're talking about these mitigations in the context of vaccination or not, um, to, to note that they can reduce risk, but they don't necessarily eliminate it. And that's why we, we really do need to think about this in the context of vaccination as well, because I think that vaccination really can change these numbers. Now, everybody has been talking about the Delta variant and the recent news that people who are vaccinated may be able to transmit Delta. So I thought I'd just take a brief moment to explain how variants come to be. They are entirely expected. Um, you can see RNA viruses here, like SARS coronavirus 2, have a very high mutation rate because the RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, the enzymes that replicate their genomes, uh, do have a higher mutation rate and they have no proofreading capability. They also have fairly small genomes, which means that uh, each, each mutation has a greater chance, effectively, of having a high impact. Now, this can be a positive impact or a negative impact for the virus. Sorry about that. Um, and this just really explains how that works. So in, with any virus, you have the parental virus, gets into a cell, infects it, starts replicating, and then it makes mistakes as it's copying that genome. And as I mentioned before, it can't really correct them, although SARS coronavirus 2 does have an enzyme that's kind of like a, a not very good spell checker that can do a little bit of proofreading. So it does have an overall lower mutation rate than other RNA viruses, but still much higher than uh, higher eukaryotes or even DNA viruses. Um, in any case, that virus will make a bunch of copies of itself in any cell that it infects. Some of those will have mutations that don't have any effect. Some of them will have mutations in places that have a deleterious effect to the virus. And some will be uh, coincidentally in places where uh, it gives the virus some type of competitive advantage. And that appears to be what happened with Delta. Um, as the, that virus goes on to infect other cells, other hosts and continue to replicate, any mutant that has an advantage will eventually outcompete all of the other viruses in the population, and that will become a, a new variant. And that appears to be exactly what's happened with all of these variants of concern. They all have some type of advantage that allows them to outcompete the parental viruses, uh, and so they become dominant. So, how do these variants affect travel? Um, well, it's it's very complicated, and Kathy also did a really nice job of showing some maps that are a lot cleaner and easier to read than this one from Next Strain. But what this is really showing is uh, this phylogenetic tree here over on the left, which shows all of the different variants of concern or variants of interest, including alpha, um, beta, gamma, and delta, and it really shows their distribution uh, throughout the world. Um, and you can't really see it here because inconveniently the delta wedge of the pie that's in the US is covered up by the, the pie from Mexico. But um, we see delta in most countries is really gathering a uh, foothold. It's gaining traction very quickly. It's beginning to displace alpha, which was previously the dominant variant throughout the world. Um, you can see these other variants, you know, lambda, People have been talking about that quite a bit. It's here in South America. It's not clear that that is going to be able to outcompete Delta, um, but it, it certainly does look in many places like Delta is really beginning to outcompete Alpha as well as Beta and Gamma and the other variants of interest. So that's what that's one of the reasons why everybody's watching uh, Delta because it's basically knocking the previous uh, dominant variant Alpha off the top. So here's what all four of these variants of concern uh, are really all about. These are the mutations throughout the genome. Um, now you see that they're not just in the spike protein, but those are the mutations that we tend to pay the most attention to because they both affect transmissibility and infectivity, um, as well as infect, uh, or affect all of the vaccines which have been designed um, for, against the spike protein in general. So um, one thing to note here is that alpha and delta both have this mutation at the site 681 in the spike protein. That's right at the S1, S2 junction. Um, this is the furin cleavage site that's uh, been discussed quite a bit in terms of the origins of this virus. And what the furin cleavage site does is it provides a spot for an enzyme called furin to essentially cut the spike protein in half at this, at this spot 
and expose uh, part of the protein that's involved in membrane fusion. This is really important for infectivity. Um, so it, it looks like this P681H mutation and now P681R mutation in Delta um, is really linked to this increased transmissibility because as I said before, Alpha and Delta are more transmissible. Beta and Gamma are capable of evading some neutralizing antibody responses. That's probably because of these receptor binding domain mutations here um, that are also important neutralizing epitopes. But it looks like that receptor binding isn't as important for transmissibility uh, as this, this furin cleavage site mutation, um, at least judging by Alpha and Delta compared to Beta and Gamma. And that's why first alpha outcompeted beta and gamma, and now delta is outcompeting alpha. So delta is more transmissible. This was a slide that was famously leaked last week by the Washington Post that the CDC showed um, that, that shows that the delta variant is just as contagious as chickenpox. Um, now, uh, you know, this, this can be a little bit misleading because R0, which is what this is based on, is really uh, not a static number. It's dynamic and it can change based on the types of mitigations you put in place. But the Delta variant is for sure more transmissible than uh, pre prior strains of SARS coronavirus 2, including Alpha. And that's why we do need to take it seriously. And then of course, there's this alarming data. This is from the same presentation to the CDC that shows that there is a decrease in vaccine efficacy or effectiveness um, against Delta. But I think that this is being discussed in a way that's somewhat misleading. First of all, vaccine effectiveness is really, uh, is really measured based on vaccines ability to prevent symptomatic COVID-19, not infection altogether. Um, and we saw this very alarming data come out of Israel that showed a significant reduction in vaccine effectiveness against both infection and symptomatic disease um, down to 64% from up here in the 90s. And that seems like a huge drop, but these numbers have since actually been revised because there was a mistake in the way that the denominator was calculated. So actually this, this isn't as big of a drop in vaccine effectiveness as this seems. And you can see that for Delta um, in all of the places where this has been looked at so far, the vaccine does retain very high effectiveness at preventing hospitalization and death. So in this case, um, the vaccines are very effective versus Delta. They remain effective versus Delta, at least when people have been fully vaccinated, even if they're not quite as effective at preventing uh, asymptomatic infection or mild symptomatic disease. Um, but they're still actually pretty good. I would argue that 88 and 87 uh, percent effectiveness against symptomatic disease is, is still pretty darn good uh, when, you, when you think about how much lower it could be. Um, and then, of course, as Kathy noted, um, there was this study that came out last Friday that everybody was very alarmed about, about this outbreak that occurred in Provincetown, Massachusetts, um, during an event that was very conducive to transmission. And this is why things like this don't tell you the complete story. As Kathy repeatedly emphasized, it is true that measuring viral RNA does not directly correlate with measuring infectious virus. Uh, so that's, that's one thing here so far. The other thing is this is PCR testing um, and PCR testing is very sensitive, but as Kathy pointed out, it can also detect viral RNA that's not associated with infectious virus. So if a virus is in a person who is vaccinated, if it is replicating in that cell, um, but it is not spreading or it is not shedding infectious virus, you will still potentially see the same CT values as an unvaccinated people, but that person will be differentially contagious. Um, and we've seen similar data now from Wisconsin as well that shows uh, no significant differences in CT value. This is just with a PCR assay that's targeting a different part of the virus from this one, which was uh, targeting ORF1A. This one targets the N protein or nucleocapsid protein. Um, but they, they essentially show the same thing. Similar levels of viral RNA in people with Delta, regardless of vaccination status, but no indication that vaccinated people are responsible for a lot of onward transmission, particularly to other vaccinated people. In my opinion, the biggest risk here is transmission to unvaccinated people, because those are the people who have no protection against uh, symptomatic disease and against severe symptomatic disease. Um, while we still need to do more work to figure out if vaccinated people can transmit 
can transmit onward. I think that there is some data to suggest that that they may not. And that's from this preprint that was uh, published also last week out of Singapore. So this also looked at vaccine breakthrough cases with Delta. Um, and it showed that with Delta, people who were vaccinated had effectively equivalent CT values very early on post-infection or post-symptom onset. Um, as same as unvaccinated people, but there was very quickly a big difference in this. So six days after infection, you start to see these two curves separate. People with vaccine breakthrough essentially start having showing a very rapid increase in CT value, which corresponds with a, a rapid decrease in viral RNA load compared to unvaccinated people. That suggests that in vaccinated people, uh, any breakthrough infection is being cleared much more quickly than it would be in an unvaccinated person. We also see much, much higher levels of neutralizing antibodies, at least as determined by the pseudovirus neutralization assay uh, that they used here in vaccinated people compared to unvaccinated. So this really suggests that actually vaccines are working the way that they are supposed to, that people who have been vaccinated do have these rapid, rapid responses uh, to breakthrough infection and uh, are capable of clearing the virus potentially through the action of neutralizing antibodies. So what are some virological mechanisms for these observations? Well, I was just talking about that a little bit, but here I'll just go briefly into some more detail. When a virus, SARS-Coronavirus-2, infects your cells, um, the first step is binding an entry. Now, if a vaccine can prevent infection altogether, it's probably because of neutralizing antibodies, uh, preventing the virus from getting into the cells in the first place at this step. But if you're exposed to enough virus, and there is some data that suggests that people infected with Delta have much higher viral loads than people uh, infected with other, with other variants, um, then you, know, you can be exposed to enough virus. That even if you're vaccinated, you, you can become infected. So this, then the virus is going to go through its, its replication cycle, um, but your body will, is primed to recognize this virus. And so it will rapidly um, induce anamnestic responses. I should say anamnestic. Um, that, that means that it will start cranking out tons and tons of neutralizing antibody. That might mean that progeny virus, new viruses being synthesized that would go on and infect another cell in your body or infect another person are going to be neutralized before they can go do that because of all these neutralizing antibodies that are out there. And then this anamnestic response also um, triggers cytotoxic T cells or CD8 positive T cells to go around killing infected cells as well as cytokine induced memory natural killer cells. And this will rapidly remove uh, any infected cells so you can't even make any more new virus. Um, this could potentially explain what we're seeing from Singapore, um, why these vaccines might not actually mean that people who are vaccinated and infected are equally contagious, even though they have equal levels of viral RNA shortly after exposure. Um, of course, this is all a hypothesis, needs to be tested more, uh, but this is consistent with how we know vaccines uh, prime the immune response to occur very rapidly upon re-exposure to the antigen. So that's the, now's the big question. Do we need boosters? Um, I think that partly depends on what you on how you define vaccine effectiveness, but as I mentioned, all of these trials have defined it based on uh, their ability to protect against symptomatic COVID-19. Based on that metric, um, I don't think we need boosters right now based on this data. Um, that said, you know, in many countries that have surplus doses, boosters may well be recommended, and I don't think boosters are unsafe. Um, but I do think that, that we might do better by prioritizing immunizations in unvaccinated populations rather than boosting in countries with surplus doses. Because as I said, back when I was talking about mitigation measures, um, the, the way that some of these mitigation measures work really does depend on prevalence in any given country. If we can vaccinate broadly in many different countries, especially those that haven't had broad access to vaccines, prevalence is going to go down overall. So I would argue that, that for uh, vaccines to help with reopen international travel, um, that, that really we'd be better off prioritizing vaccines for people who haven't yet had any vaccine versus boosting people who've already been vaccinated with vaccines that by most measures are actually still quite effective even against Delta.
And I agree completely with what Kathy said also, that um, just because, you know, it may be that vaccination uh, doesn't result in, you know, equally contagious people infected with Delta, that doesn't mean that we should avoid precautionary measures. I think it makes a lot of sense to combine vaccination with mitigating non-pharmaceutical interventions because we already know that those can be effective at reducing transmission in highly vaccinated countries uh, while, we, while we make an effort to vaccinate the rest of the world in an equitable way. That's really how we're going to end this for all of us. And that is how we can safely, I think, reopen travel. The key is to get as many people fully immunized as possible. So with that, I'll finish with my acknowledgements, uh, my Twitter handle and my email in case you wanna get in touch with me. Um, and thank you very much for having me here. I'm really looking forward to uh, the rest of the presentations of these discussions.